Hey, good morning, or afternoon, or whatever you want to call it. I'm glad to see you guys. Hopefully, we'll be joined by some people. I'm actually sweating outside right now. I took a walk around my block, and uh, I am pouring in sweat. I don't know if that's because I'm out of shape or because uh, it's actually hot and humid in Texas. So hello to anyone who is there. We'll wait just a little bit to see if people get on and we can see about reviewing together, taking any questions as you know your test is Thursday. Uh, and that should be a big deal. Um, hopefully all of you have gotten um, emails from College Board uh, telling you about um, telling you about um, the information that you need. Uh, tomorrow the test, I want to remind you, the posted test is an hour ahead because I think it gives you the time in Eastern Standard Time. And in case you did not know, you do not live in Eastern Standard Time. You live in Central. So they are one hour ahead of us over there. So just to let you know uh, that situation. Also, I've been posting on the Remind account a lot of uh, links for reviews. There's a lot of really good reviews by a lot of really great experienced teachers. There's one from a, a male teacher and one by a female teacher. So if you have a preference or men are boring or women are boring or whatever it is, you have some choices there. Or if you want to listen to both, uh, they've got really, really good material. Uh, one of the YouTube channels called Anti-Social Studies, I think she did a writing a DB2 live earlier today. And so I think that's really cool and worth your time. So. Uh, we might just have four people joining us, and so I did send out a document. Uh, I posted on Teams, which is a World AP World History Study Guide Pack for 2020, and uh, that's what we're going to go ahead and kind of look through and commit an hour of time to going with uh, going through with you guys, taking any questions and comments. That's super fun. That's super great. Um, it says uh, first of all. I guess I just want to make a, some broad comments about the test before we get into the material. But one of the things I just would really like to stress is you guys pay attention to those rubrics. Uh, there was a lesson we went through uh, that kind of particularly kind of walked you through how to write the, the exam. And I think that's really big because one of the things the rubric points out is that you need to keep your discussion to the time period. You know, I've been doing a lot of grading in the last few days and some of the assignments have had like short answer responses that need one or two sentence responses and I can't tell you how many responses give me a response that has nothing to do with the time period. One of our assignments talked about like a manifest destiny or like how America became a superpower or became a global power rather and it was in the discussion of like the Mexican-American war and the Spanish-American war so our material is in the 1800s, then it would make sense that your response would be from the 1800s. You know, it makes sense that you're going to tell me about the Mexican-American War, about the Spanish-American War, about gobbling up places like Hawaii, uh, armed interventions in Central America. Like, that would make sense. Instead, I had so many kids in a question about the content of the 1800s tell me, yes, the United States became a global power because of World War II. And um, the wording of those responses, again, was like word for word. And it kind of saddens me because it's very specific wording and even like the misspelled phrasing, word for word, that even at the end of our social distancing time, there's still a lot of copy and paste, a lot of cheating happening. Um, regardless of cheating, um, regardless of cheating, um, World War II has nothing to do with the 1800s. Uh, so you cheated and copied and pasted from someone an answer that's outside of the time period. So tomorrow, with the um, with the prompt 
there's probably going to be four prompts tomorrow. Stay in the time period as much as possible. You know, ta- you know, for us with the COVID-19, all the 20th century stuff, it's not even going to be part of it. With the 20th century, all the 20th century stuff is not going to be part of it. Um, it would be really good to focus on the question. Look at what is the question asking you to do and then answer fully. Another thing that I think in general some of you guys struggle with is offering evidence and examples. For example, uh, there was a question that was asked of you guys asking, you know, how did social Darwinism impact how non-white people were treated in the Americas, in the United States? And like the number one answer I got was uh, social Darwinism led non-white people to be treated badly, period. Um, There was a question asking you, you know, why was the United States interested in the Pacific? And the answer was because of manifest destiny period. Um, what are ways that the United States intervened in Latin America? Answers that I got, common answers I got. There were so many ways and so many examples of the United States intervening whenever they wanted, period. And so I guess what I'm saying is that like what I've noticed is like a real lack of any sort of details or evidence um, to back up your 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 arguments and again i just want to like just remind you guys that that's what you need to do you have to provide evidence and details and not broad generalizations if you were my lawyer and i was accused of murder i don't want you to go up to the judge and say your honor there's so many people who could say lacone did not do this thing thank you very much and then you sit down i want to hear examples well listen tomorrow you're a lawyer making an argument and the witnesses are your documents. You need to call your documents to the stand. You need to be using your documents. And again, to use your document does not mean to quote your document. To use your document does not mean to quote your document. You don't have to. You can make reference to your document. Um, You can refer to it and then simply cite it like doc three or if you're going to be dealing with something in a group if you're arranging if you're sorting it out into a group you can say docs four five and seven for example and i'm putting these on the comments Uh, those are things that you can do um also email me if you have not gotten something from College Board, uh, like the ticket or whatever that they said that they're going to do. Uh, hi, Yanelli. Uh, if you have not gotten something, or if you're here, there's seven people here, of the seven who are here, has anyone gotten a ticket or something from College Board? Um, I know Josiah says he's not gotten anything. Of the eight online now, has anyone gotten anything from College Board? I, I think you were supposed to have gotten something two days ahead of time or something like that. Uh, Yanelli did, and Chloe did. Okay, so what did it, what, what was it, was there a number uh, that was different or something like that? When, when did you get it? kids who got it, Chloe, Sebastian, when did you all get that? So they're going to tell us. So tell us when you got it and what exactly you received from them. Okay, yesterday. And what what is it? What was the e-ticket? Is it a link? Is it just like a an ID number that you already had? Is it a link that you guys click? And good news is, let's say that something disastrous happens. You don't get it or whatever. Okay, so it's a link with your ID number. Cool, thank you. So I would say check your junk email, perhaps. Um, see if that, if it's in your junk. Also make sure it's the email address that is on record for you at College Board. And that's like one of the reasons, like one of the like the 
I thought easy assignment was just go to College Board and take a screenshot that shows like the email of records you have and put that into Teams. It turns out that was not easy. That caused like mass confusion, and maybe that's my fault, and that's fine. Um, but check it's the email that College Board has on record for you. And so if if worst case scenario, you want to take this test and they haven't been giving you the link and there's no way to get through, I think there's a customer service number as well at College Board that you can get on the phone with. The worst case, you're super excited about taking the test. You want to take college, possibly get college credit because maybe it's easier this year than any other year. Because like even if you don't get credit, I've been told that your teacher has a chance to appeal. And I'm happy to appeal for any one of you that gives me a solid, that submits a solid essay. Um, there's a, there's a, like a makeup day, like in a week or a week and a half. So like worst case scenario, there's that option. So anyway, pay attention to the rubric, do what it's telling you to do, keep in your time period, answer all of the questions, answer all of the question, give evidence and examples, use your documents and you don't have to quote it. In fact, you're probably just wasting time because the readers know what the test says. You're wasting your time. You can make reference to it. You should. You know, document five explains that imperialism was a result of economic interest as seen in X, Y, and Z. So just think about that. Uh, those those uh, videos that we watched, there was two videos assigned on how to write the DBQ. I think super helpful. You might want to think about going through that again. And also there are the two sets of teachers, one in anti-social studies uh, who is doing review videos. Those are great. I think one is going to be live today after this time. And uh, I would encourage you to go there. So uh, with that, any questions you can put in comments, that'd be great. I put up a review a packet on our Teams page. Um, unit one for us begins from the year 1200 to 1450. And that's what we're going to kind of look in now. And one of the things that if you look in the handout, it says there's a couple of big developments in Asia. And it says that China maintained its rule through cultural traditions rooted in Neo-Confucianism. And, and that's like one of the big philosophies that we took note of is that how Confucianism was like such a grounding influence in China. And Neo-Confucianism was that that revival of Confucianism. And you might remember it was a revival because they had to deal with, with Buddhism having come in. You know, Buddhism was a religion from India that had been introduced to China. And there was some tension between Buddhism and Chinese society. Some of the tension came because Buddhism said that you don't have to get married to be a Buddhist. Buddhism said that you can be a woman and become enlightened. And a lot of this challenged these traditional patriarchal roles that we saw in Confucianism. And so Neo-Confucianism is this, this stressing of Buddhism again. And they did some things like closing down Buddhist temples. They did some things like pushing a physical practice, um, the physical practice of foot binding, right? And so we see that. And one of the really important things about Confucianism is this term called filial piety. And filial piety is like respecting your ancestors, respecting your elders. One of the problems with Buddhism is it says you don't have to get married. How can you respect your ancestors if you're choosing not to have kids? How can you respect your ancestors if you're choosing not to have a family? So there's some of this tension that's there. It says uh, Chinese belief system influenced the surrounding regions. And Chinese innovations in agriculture and manufacturing enabled China to flourish economically and for sure, you know, like China was uh, really doing well in 12 to 1400s. Uh, we see a lot of different religions moving around Asia in the 12 to 1400s. We see Hinduism in not just India, but throughout Southeast Asia. We see Buddhism and Islam. Both Buddhism and Islam are missionary religions. You know, these are religions that they are. Um, they're universal, or, or, or Islam at least is a universal religion. You know, they say there's no prophet but Muhammad. And so they're interested in people converting. And Buddhism does too. You know, we talked about how the Silk Road moves these religions along, and for sure they did. Uh, in India, you might remember that they have a caste system. There's this pyramid of power, and there's these white elite who are literate called the Brahmin, who knew all the rituals. And uh, they were the ones in power. Every society has some sort of pyramid of power. 
and Hinduism was no exception to that. Um, what else? Uh, Islam is a huge, huge player the, in this time period from 12 to fi uh, from 12 to 1450, and the three largest Abrahamic religions continue to have a big impact. But Islam uh, has a really big in impact because you might remember there's really no separation between like church and state, so not church and state, but like church, mosque and state, let's say. And there were some empires that you should know by name. You might remember that Islam spread militarily. They united Arabia, united all of North Africa. They united the Middle East. And one of the empires you should know by name is the Abbasid Caliphate. And it did begin to decline. And we do see other... Islam doesn't go away, but this one Muslim empire goes away. But it's replaced by other empires. It says the medieval Muslim world was dominated by the Mamluks and the Seljuk Turks who ruled the declining empire. Empires and individual states within Dar al-Islam, and there's that phrase, we've actually used it before, Dar al-Islam means like the realm of Muslims, ruled by Muslims, uh, fostered intellectual activity. It says there was advances in math and medicine. We kind of talked about that with like Arabic numerals, you know, like the white Western world was using Roman numerals. And if you wanted to do your algebra two or your geometry and you had a choice between using Arabic numerals, which we which are on your keyboard right now, or using Roman numerals, which are are not used by us in math classes, I mean it's like a no-brainer, right? So Islam impacts us to the fact that even in my math class to this day, the result of Dar al Islam is seen. And so they embrace that, they foster that, they're all for that. So there's a there's a mix of church and state in the Muslim world. They want to promote Islam, and also they love science, they love math, and they, they really do well with that. What about Europe? Well, Europe continued to be dominated by the same cultural forces that influenced it during the Middle Ages notably Christianity, just like the Middle East, just like North Africa, just like Arabia is dominated by Islam, there's another religion that dominates the world, and that's Christianity. They dominate Western Europe, and it says Europe was decentralized and fragmented. You know, there was one Roman Empire, that Roman Empire broke up, and now you have a bunch of Western kingdoms, uh, Western European kingdoms. There's an England, there's a France, there's a Portugal, there's all these different things. And there was a work system called feudalism that led to distinct social hierarchies. And so feudalism, you have the king on top. He divides up land to people below him. On the very bottom are the serfs who are not slaves, but they definitely aren't being paid well. Uh, feudalism led to distinct social and economic hierarchies with lords, vassals. Vassals are people that you get land from. You give land to knights and serfs having particular roles. Remember, you give labor in exchange for protection. There's a related word called manoralism. It was a dominant system of organizing rural economies. You know, you live on a manor. A manor is like this self-sufficient farm. There are fields for farming. There's forests for hunting. There's ponds for fishing. There's a church for worship. And so life was not based on international trade in the Middle Ages. It was based on my local manner. Absolute monarchs were developing more sophisticated forms of government, like the British Parliament. You know, we do see the beginning of Parliament. We do begin to see the formation of documents like the Magna Carta, which puts some limits on what the king can do. And so we do see some checks there. Um, it says in the Americas from 12 to 1450, there are some empires to note. For example, the Aztec Empire is existent from the 1200s to 1400s. The Aztec Empire thrived in large states like the capital Tino Tenochtitlan. It had big buildings, these pyramids. They did human sacrifice. It was terrible. Uh, other Native Americans were, didn't like that, but that is what happened. South America also has an empire as well, just like Mexico has the Aztecs, South America has the Inca, major empire that unified much of modern day Peru, and both of these, the Aztec and the Inca, they go away because of the Spanish conquest.
There's an African empire and a leader that you should know by name. And that African leader's name is Mansa Musa. There's a picture of him in, his docu in the document. You might remember that Mansa Musa was like in modern day equivalents would be a billionaire. You know, he had so much money. He went from Mali, uh, which is in Western Africa on Hajj. Hajj is the pilgrimage to go to Mecca that you have to do once in your lifetime. And he gave away like so much gold gifts, like gold as a gift that he caused like massive inflation everywhere he went. And so there's a famous picture of him on a map. And that's because there was a time if you ask white Europeans, hey, man, what do you think about when you think about like African leaders? Now, today you might think, oh, African leaders, there's corruption, there's generals, there's violence. And that is true in many African countries. But this time, some Europeans said, oh, African leaders, African kings, oh, they're just like ridiculously rich and have access to gold. And they did. Mansa Musa built a magnificent series of mosques. These are religious holy places for Muslims in his town and a library in his city of Timbuktu. And so people came from all around. The regions along the east coast of Africa were unified uh, united by the arrival of Arab Muslims whose language mixed with local Bantu. And there's a language which is formed by the mix of Bantu and Arabic coming together. This is the language that is spoken in Tanzania, uh, Uganda, part of Uganda, Kenya, even the Democratic Republic of Congo. This is a major East African language. It's called Swahili. And Islam influences this and this this interconnectivity is one of the hallmarks of islam merchants traveled throughout africa and beyond also using the trans-saharan trade network we see camel caravans linking north and south and many of them being muslims network of exchanges from 12 to 1450 we see that the silk road is a huge part of that you know the silk road uh, links Asia and Europe before and after 1250, 1200. Uh, improvements in business practices that helped the Silk Road was the ex the formation of credit. You know that uh, there was lines of credit that you could send uh, money, promises to pay uh, money for long distance travel, luxury goods, which was really important. And all along the Silk Road, major trading cities sprung up. I think we made a reference to the Pixar movie Cars and this and that. In the Pixar movie Cars, uh, Isai, this review is not a grade. Thank you for asking. And FYI, you'll notice there was no assignment posted for the review Isai. And you might also remember that I said yesterday many times, last lesson, last lecture, yesterday. So Isai, too. I know that you were concerned yesterday about too much work. Just want to tell you, uh, this is just a review for those of us who want to review for the test. So good question. Thanks for asking. Uh, anyway, um, we made a reference to like the Pixar movie Cars because like in Cars, Radiator Springs was like super important because it was a long route. And when the freeway came, it like went away. It wasn't like a thing. And in the same way, there's like these trade cities all along the Silk Road that were important. And then today, they're really nothing. You know, they're nothing that anyone knows about. The Mongol Empire and the making of the modern world. The Mongols were a group of nomadic people from Central, Central Asia. They were originally scattered and they were fragmented. And then there was one guy who unified them. And the one guy who unified them was Genghis Khan. And during the 1200s, he created the largest land-based empire the world has ever seen. And you might remember there's a word to describe this result. Like, yes, thousands, tens of thousands of people were killed brutally. And that's terrible and that's bad. But after all the killing and dying is done, there's a term that describes this on your handout. It's called Pax Mongolica. And Pax Mongolica is this meaning that now that there's just one empire controlling all of Asia, guess what happens to trade and guess what happens to travel? Trade and travel, it goes up. It goes up, right? Because there's not 20 different borders. There's not 20 different, you know, okay, well, you got to pay an import tax, an export tax. It's just one big empire connecting pretty much all of Asia. 
And so trade and travel goes up during Pax Mongolica. Uh, they implement standardized weights and measures. So even like for us, like, you know, we have like gallons. We don't use like liters except for like soda bottles. Like you go get a gallon of milk or a gallon of um, gas. But, you know, other countries don't. So it can be kind of confusing having like different systems of measurements and stuff like that. The Mongol Empire says, look, we have one standard, we have one system, it's going to be the same. That kind of makes it easier. Uh, in addition to trade, the period of Mongol rule experienced cultural exchange as the transfer of Greco-Roman and Islamic scholarship to Europe and intellectual innovations uh, such as the development of the Uyghur script. So, uh, Greco-Roman ideas are coming into the Muslim world. Uh, Muslims loved um, Aristotle. Muslims loved Greek philosophers. They copied it. Uh, so Muslims are taking European ideas, and Europeans are little by little being exposed to and uh, and learning about Muslim um, Muslim culture. One of the things that it doesn't say in the review, but I think it probably should, is there was a series of wars that exposed white Europeans to the Muslim Middle East, exposed Europeans to coffee, to sugar, to uh, different things that they didn't have access to. You might remember those were the Crusades. And so that is something that, you know, really exposes the Western world to the Muslim world. And they start thinking, wow, you know, coffee's great, sugar's great. We need to really start thinking about having more access to these things. So. There's a lot of beginnings of inter, uh, intercultural connectivity. Uh, the Mongols are part of that. The Crusades are part of that as well. Changes in the Indian Ocean. After 1200, it says existing trade routes throughout the Indian Ocean expanded. Uh, remember, there's the Indian Ocean Trade Network. New trading cities, they begin to exist, like the Sultanate of Malacca. I think we talked about the Straits of Malacca on a map. Those are the choke point, meaning that if you're going from China to the Indian Ocean, there's this narrow strait, narrow body of water you have to go through. And so cities are developing there. And because of their location on these choke points, they become centers of commerce that are pretty important. Uh, we also see something important, the Swahili coast of East Africa. There's these trade cities because you might remember that one of the things that makes the Indian Ocean trade network possible is the natural phenomena of interchanging winds, the, um, the uh, monsoon wind system. And the cities all along that coast of Kenya is, are called the Swahili city-states, and they become kind of important in East Africa. Uh, it says, furthermore... A large, and here's a good vocabulary word, diaspora communities emerged. And so you have a lot of Arabs leaving the Middle East, moving to Africa, moving to India, Jews leaving their homeland, going to different places as traders. So we even see that here in the Indian Ocean trade networks, we see diaspora communities emerging, uh, especially Arabs. You know, Muslims are some of these like super duper duper Muslim Arabs, super duper uh important role in trade and in merchants they spread their faith they spread commerce they spread trade in the indian ocean muslim merchants were like one of the key key uh people involved in the peaceful expanse of trade uh so that is muslim merchants east africa we see a lot of chinese moving all throughout southeast asia as well um we also see some technology that moves around during this time. For example, the it gives you two examples. One is the astrolabe. This helps you to sail more efficiently and safely. And the other one I think we did talk in detail called the Latin sail. This is like this triangular sail that uh, ships called dows would use. And uh, the great that you get to sail using these um, wind networks, the monsoon wind networks, but the Latin sail that Dows would use would help you to sail even against the wind with some success. Uh, the monsoon winds allowed navigators to travel more safely and confidently as they built up their networks of exchange. So we have the, we have the Mongol Empire increases the Silk Road's usage. You also have uh, you also have I'm so sorry, give me one second. Okay, 
So yeah, Unit 2, we have the Mongol Empire, uh, we have the, the Silk Road, we have the Indian Ocean Trade Network, and now let's talk about the Trans-Saharan Trade Routes. The growth of international African trade between 12 and 1450 was spurred by improved technology, especially along the Trans-Saharan Trade Routes that connected West Africa and North Africa. So there is North Africa, which in the 1400s is dominated by Muslim city-states, Muslim empire, and then you have, and those are like brown-skinned North Africans. Um, and then you have the Sahara Desert. Below that, sub-Saharan Africa is what some people call like Black Africa, because there's a difference between people who are North African, brown-skinned North Africans, and Black-skinned people south of the Sahara. And Trans-Saharan is connecting both of those uh, people groups. Uh, it says um, innovations like the camel saddle made long distance journey easier and the ability of travelers to join groups of caravans encourage inter-regional trade of gold, salt, and slaves. Uh, that is another specific piece of technology. You know, if, if you're asked about evidence and examples, we're giving you evidence and examples. The Dow, uh, the Latin sale, is a piece of technology that helps trade and travel. That's a specific piece of evidence. The camel saddle is a specific piece of evidence. It's a piece of technology that helps trade and travel. And what is it that they want? They want gold. They want salt. They want slaves. And it says, in addition to goods that move along the Trans-Saharan trade routes, Ideas spread also, and one of the biggest ideas that spread across the Trans-Saharan trade routes is the spread of Islam. Especially here, so look at that list. The like the one that you should know by name is Mali. You know, Timbuktu is the city in Mali. Uh, Mansa Musa was from Mali, and how did it even get there? It get it got there from the Trans-Saharan trade route. So good to know. Cultural and environmental consequences of connectivity, in addition to shared knowledge of science and technology, the increased connectivity in Afro-Eurasia, we call it Afro-Eurasia because Africa, Europe, and Asia, they're all connected. Like, there's not like, you know, it's one big landmass, Afro-Eurasia. Uh, it led to the spread of literary, artistic, and intellectual traditions. Buddhism and Hinduism expanded. You know, Buddhism's from India, but... You know, where does Buddhism go? It goes to China, it goes to Japan, it goes to Korea. I mean, that is a huge expanse. Islam starts just in the Arabian Peninsula. It covers all of North Africa. North Africa used to be a Christian majority. Islam takes over all of North Africa, changes North Africa. The Middle East used to have huge percentages of Christians. The Middle East changes. You know, Syria used to be a place where Christianity thrived. Islam changes all of that. So we see these religions spreading during 12 to 1500. Again, I mean, I am not listing like, oh, you need to know the year 1212, you know, the year 1217 or whatever. We're saying that there's like these broad patterns, like, you know, between 12 to 1450, like there's a 250 year time period that you should have like some broad sense of information about. So I, I think that should be encouraging. You know, that should be encouraging. Like we're talking about broad general trends, not 1462 something happened. So these broad general trends, uh, Buddhism and Islam expanded in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Also, a gunpowder and paper technology spread from, look where it spread from, from China. China comes up with early block printing. They don't perfect it. Europe will perfect it. Uh, but it, China comes up with it. China comes up with uh, gunpowder. They don't perfect it. Europeans perfected. Uh, so that's something that we see there. Uh, that spread from China to other parts of the world from an increasing number of travelers. And here's two guys I would say that you should know by name. One is white and one is uh, from the Muslim world and he travels in the Muslim world. First guy is Marco Polo. And this is a super important example of a specific person you should probably know. You know, we've given you only a few people by name you should know. Like, I think in our time together, I said you should know uh, Mansa Musa. I think I said that you should know by name. That's like one dude. Uh, I think I said that you should know uh, by name uh, Genghis Khan. 
that's like two guys you should know by name. And here's the third guy you should know by name, Marco Polo. Because Marco Polo is this white Italian guy, and he goes on a trip from Italy to China, and he works in China, he lives in China, and he writes about what it was like in China. And there was two responses. Some people said, oh, that's crazy. There's no way people bathe that often. There's no way there's built that much wealth. And there's a second response. And the second response was people are like, wow, that sounds like a place we should go and try to do some business, try to trade, try to like, you know, do some work there. And Chris Columbus, we know, had a personal copy of the works of Marco Polo. And so these are things that are kind of slowly interesting and exposing Europeans to outside ideas. And the other guy by name, you should know, is Ibn Battuta. And Ibn Battuta, he traveled all around the Muslim world. He traveled through Muslim Spain, Muslim North Africa, Muslim West Africa. He went to the Middle East. I mean, Ibn Battuta went all around the world. And he wrote about both of these guys, Marco Polo and Ibn Battuta, wrote about their journeys, informing readers far and wide about the cultures they encountered. One of the things about Ibn Battuta is that everywhere he went, he was an insider and an outsider. What I mean by that is like when Marco Polo goes to China, he is an outsider. Like he is like the one white guy, right? He's an outsider. And so that's kind of important, like how we kind of like look at like a document. And even in the DBQ tomorrow, they're going to ask you about like what's the point of view and identifying like why is the point of view relevant? You know, if you're looking at Marco Polo and he's writing about China, you know, he's an outsider. And if he is complimenting the Chinese, if he's speaking high of them, you know, to some degree that's relevant because like he has no motivation to like lie, to like build up his 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 empire. You know, if like a teacher from Deer Park or a coach from Deer Park High School said, Oh yeah, the report football team this year, twenty twenty, is gonna be unstoppable. I mean, that's like important, you know. Um, if a J if a if a uh, Laporte Junior High football coach said, oh, yeah, the Laporte team is unstoppable. You know, the point of view, it doesn't mean that, that just because you work at Laporte Junior High, you don't have a relevant commentary on football. But based on the point of view, that's, that's kind of relevant. So Marco Polo is an outsider writing about what life was like in China and really just complimenting them. Ibn Battuta is both an insider and an outsider. He's an insider because he pretty much just went to Muslim lands. And so there is this common connection of everywhere he went where they're all Muslim. They all pray towards Mecca. They all have these Arabic prayers. But he was also an outsider because some places he went, he saw that Islam developed differently everywhere he went. In some countries where there were Muslim majorities, women had more freedoms and more rights. Women were dressing less modestly than he would have liked. And Islam looked different everywhere it went. And so Ibn Battuta is a good example of someone who is both an insider and an outsider. He's both inside the culture and he was in some places outside the culture. It says, um, we also see connectivity led to the diffusion of two crops to know by name. One is bananas. Bananas never were in Africa before, but they come to Africa. Rice never was in Africa before. It's from Southeast Asia, but it comes to Africa. Uh, and also, the disease uh, disease spreads as well. We have ideas spread like Christianity, Buddhism, and Islam. They spread. Plants spread. Camel, camel saddles spread. Uh, trade spreads. Ideas tra- spread. But also, disease spreads. We see that with COVID-19 today. But in the 12 to 1500s, in this broad 200-year period, you should know the big disease is the bubonic plague or the Black Death. Started in China, which is kind of interesting because COVID-19 started in China. So many of our recent pandemics have started in China. And it spread to Europe through trade routes that killed, look at this on the handout, half of Europe's population. It's anywhere between, I've seen usually a third, but here it says half. So, you know, there might be some uncertainty there. Okay, and that's unit two. Uh, what about the third, the unit three? Unit three is from 1450 to 1750. And it says the theme is land-based empires. And if you look at the map on the handout, there's three land-based empires we've actually talked about before. There is the Ottoman Empire, the Safavid Empire, and the Mughal Empire. And you should know all three of these have something in common. They're all Muslim 
empires. In this 300 year period, again, this is a broad category, we see the expansion of land-based empires. And we are later gonna see that there are land-based empires and there are sea-based empires. And it turns out one is gonna have a more lasting impact than the other. But these empires are sometimes have a nickname and sometimes they're called, and it says on the handout, black bold lettered, gunpowder empires. And it says that they conducted their expansion through the widespread use of gunpowder cannons and other technology. And that is true. These three, these three Muslim empires, the Mughal, the Safavids, the Ottomans, they are gunpowder empires. They're going to use guns. You know, white people are not the only ones who use guns. These empires, though, are not going to develop navies. And that is going to be one of the things that puts them at a disadvantage. It says in East Asia, it's not even on this particular map, but there's the Manchu. The Manchu invaded Beijing, removing the Ming Dynasty, and they started the Qing Dynasty. There was two times that we've seen that non-Chinese uh, ruled China. The Mongols invaded China, and that was sad and disappointing. Uh, the, the, and that was the first time. And then here's the second time. China was like in chaos, and they invited these people called the Manchu. They said, hey, can you help us be security, to beef up safety in China? And the Manchu said, we'd love to do that. But when they got to Beijing, they said, well, well since we're here, we're just going to actually just going to take over. And they became the Qing dynasty. So that's the second time China's been taken over by non-Chinese people, which is super embarrassing. It says three of the dominant empires from this period were the Mughal, which was pretty much most of South Asia, like modern-day India and Pakistan. You might remember something about the Mughal, is that this was a Muslim minority ruling a Hindu majority. And at first, you know, when the Muslims moved into India, they smashed statues, because the thing is, like, Hinduism is, like, pretty much about as anti-Islam as you can get. You know, like, Islam says there's no God but Allah and Muhammad's his prophet, there's just one, right? And in Hinduism, there's hundreds of millions of manifestations of God. So it's a bit of tension there. Uh, the Mughal, uh, there's also the Safavid, which is like in purple on the map, that's modern day Iran. The thing about the Safavids, you might remember that the Safavids were pretty much the world's only major Shia empire. Remember, there's two types of Muslims. Sunnis are 80%, Shia are 20%, and most Shia live in modern-day Iran and the and, and modern-day Iraq. And if you look at the map, it actually is all of Iran and some portion of Iraq. That's the Safavids. Uh, and then, of course, the Ottoman Empire, which we've talked a lot, a lot about later. It, you know, it, at one point, it's like a real threat, and like it looks like if you take out Europe, they get to like almost taking over Austria. But then they slowly start declining, and they earn this nickname called the Sick Man of Europe, you might remember. Uh, and so... These are the three empires that we see. Uh, how do empires rule? How do they administer? It says rulers uh, of land-based empires use a variety of methods to legitimize their power, maintain order, and exercise control. The Ottomans recruited soldiers through the practice of Dev Shermi. You might remember that the Ottomans did this in particular where a lot of the Balkan Peninsula was taken over by the Ottomans. And you know who, like, the, the main religion of those people were? They were mainly Christian. And the Deb Shermi was like this slave system, actually, where they would take Christian boys and take them from their communities and put them in Muslim homes. And they would kind of facilitate almost, almost like a forced conversion to Islam. And they would become soldiers. And the thing that they would give them is guns. You know, the traditional cavalry didn't want anything to do with guns. And early guns had a tendency to misfire and blow up, you know, from time to time. And so they, they gave the guns to the Christians who slowly gave up their Christianity. That was Those soldiers, those slave soldiers, were called Janissaries. And that's like one way that they ruled their empire, the Jeb Shermi. It says the Japanese professionalized the military forces by creating a network of salaried samurai. That means that. In Japan, they didn't have slave soldiers in the army. They had highly respected samurai who were almost like knights in Japan. 
Brewers around the world continued long-standing practice such as human sacrifice. We see that particularly in Mesoamerica. Mesoamerica is like is Latin America, it's Mexico, South America, etc. Uh, in Europe, rulers promoted an idea that we've talked about before, particularly from 1450 to 1750, called the divine right of kings. The divine right of kings is a philosophy, I would say, that is black bolt lettered in the handout. It's something you should know by name. Divine right of kings is this idea that there is someone who put the king on the throne. And you know who put the king on the throne? God put the king on the throne. And if God put the king on the throne, guess who's the only one who could take him off the throne? Ultimately, who is he only accountable to? He's only really accountable to God. And so that's what people came to believe. And there is a example that you should know by name. It's on the handout. It's called Versailles. Versailles was like that elaborate palace in France. And that was a place of political distraction where King Louis, there was a, a king of France, Louis, who had a nickname. He was called the Sun King because all the planets revolve around the sun. And King Louis believed that all of France's political institutions should revolve around his person. And the Versailles was a place where if there was a politician or a prince who questioned him or disagreed with him, you could actually just have them over to Versailles and say, hey, let's gamble, let's have some drinks, let's have food, there's going to be women there. And all of a sudden, you forgot about all the things you didn't like about him. And that reinforced the divine right of kings. Versailles became a symbol of power. Other symbols of power in the Mughal Empire in modern day India was the Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal is like this iconic building. People mistakenly think it is a temple. It's not. They think it's a holy religious place, like a place of worship. It's not. It's not a palace. It was a place for his wife. The emperor of the Mughal Empire buried his wife there. So super example, just like the wealth. Big changes in belief systems. Predominant religions of earlier periods like Christianity continued to dominate between 14 to 1750. During this time, however, there was a dramatic new change that shaped subsequent belief systems. One of the biggest things you should know by name from 14, uh, 1450 to 1750 is the Protestant Reformation by none other than Martin Luther, which we've mentioned and talked about before. You might remember that he disagreed with a lot of elements of the Catholic Church, like the selling of indulgences and the existence of a place called purgatory. And people started to leave the Catholic Church. And that caused the Catholic Church to say, you know what, we might need to reevaluate some things. We might need to make some changes. And the Catholic Church does try to vamp up and make some changes. Those changes are called the Catholic counter Reformation. They're countering the Reformation with some changes that occurred. The other big divide, not only do we have Catholics and Protestants, but of course, during the same time period, we have increased tensions between the two Muslims, the Sunnis and the Shias. Okay, with that, we're now in Unit 4, Transoceanic Connections. Now from 1450 to 1750, what is the biggest thing that starts happening? People get on boats. Uh, it says that we, again, are seeing technology. There's a ship here, you should know by name, called the Caravel. Uh, it says this is an example of technology. Using a new ship type, the Caravel, the Portuguese were able to explore the West African coast. And so this was something that was being used to sail up rivers. You know, they didn't know anything about the West African coast. And Portuguese were the first white people to start exploring the coast of Africa using these new ships, which were super important. They also used improved technology like the compass. European nations were motivated to compete in international exploration in order to gain wealth, promote Christianity, and dominate their rivals. Remember, like, there's not one Europe, there's like 12 European countries or whatever. All of them are competing. All of them want like a leg up. And the fact that Europe is divided actually turns out to be a good thing because they're divided. They're, they're constantly trying to outdo one another. They want to be the first to trade because, you know, right now at this time, who's dominating trade in Europe? The Italians. You know what the Italians are doing to the prices of goods? They're jacking up the price of goods. So there's all of this competition. And there's a 
term that you should be familiar with called mercantilism. Uh, this was spread by the Portuguese, Spanish, English, French, and Dutch, and they began to sponsor exploration and invest money into trade. Uh, Vasco da Gama was the first in uh, the first Portuguese guy to reach India. You might remember that the Portuguese start sailing around the coast of Africa, and they get to India. And when they get there, like the Indians, laugh at these really poor quality European products. Chris Columbus, of course reaches the new world starting a whole new ballpark. The big term that you should know by name, really good to use, is the Columbian Exchange. You might remember this is the movement of goods, of ideas, of diseases. It is a groundbreaking, changing thing. Uh, things that never existed in Europe are brought. Corn never existed, was brought. Tomatoes and potatoes, that was never brought before. Tobacco was brought to the to the uh, oh, from the Americas to the New World. So these things change history forever. We've mentioned disease like smallpox by name. We also mentioned that if 90% of the Native Americans die from diseases like smallpox, and Europeans still want to harvest plantations and mines, they have to bring over someone who's already had some exposure to it. And that is Black African slaves. Um, so, hold on one second. Sorry. Uh, so, that's what we see. You know, uh, we see, we see uh, the Columbian Exchange bring all these types of changes. Uh, we also see, uh, Animals that never had been in the Americas, like rats and mosquitoes, bring smallpox, malaria, and measles. Um, maritime empires were established, maintained, and developed at this time. Um, I would say it, there are some words here that I would draw your attention to. It says that there was a plant. Uh, it says there was a plantation of agriculture uh, that demanded labor. So millions of Africans are going to go to the New World. And it says European colonial economies were built by incorporating not only slavery, but also two words that you might be familiar with. One, one is encomienda, which is where they would like force actually the Native Americans who didn't die off. The encomienda was like a forced semi-forced labor system where like one out of seven Native Americans would have to like leave their um, leave their communities and go work for the Spaniards and mines and stuff like that. Economically, Europeans were able to control their fin and finance their overseas territories by practicing mercantilism and something we've talked about before called joint stock companies, which these are kind of like the precursors to capitalism where that you can like sell stock in a corporation. Mercantilism, of course, is this idea that colonies exist to provide you with raw materials. Those raw materials get sent in triangular trade to Europe. The only and, and by the way, in mercantilism, you cannot sell or buy from anyone else for cheaper. It's just the way it is. Also, it says this in part due to mineral resources for the americas europeans had control over the flow of silver the global control of silver the spanish in particular had a huge wealth but remember there's something really bad that results from spanish silver that they got from south america that led to global inflation and that was very problematic for the spanish um ba -ba -ba -ba. I will go to changing social hierarchies. As populations from different regions became more intermingled, many regions experienced cultural synthesis. That means cultures coming together. Um, and states had to figure out how to deal with diversity. New elites, like the rulers of the Qing, enforced restrictive policies. And another example, this is like the biggest example we probably stressed, was that in the Iberian Peninsula, that's Spain and Portugal, Jews were expelled. They were kicked out. They kicked out the Jews. They kicked out the Jews. And so as Spain wants to become like one one culture, one group, they kick out the outsiders. And sadly, the Jews are part of that. Okay. Last unit, unit five. 
that's 1750 to 1900. The big, 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 big thing you should know by name is the Enlightenment. Ideological shifts in the Atlantic world between 1750 and 1900 is seen in Enlightenment philosophies. They re-examined the role of religion and began to question the role of religion, not necessarily reject, but definitely question the role of religion. As a result of these new ways of thinking in Europe and the Americas, there was things that people began to embrace, like the ideas of human rights, the role of the individual, and social hierarchies. And really, just because the Enlightenment starts stressing natural rights, it's not like, okay, I have to make a choice. I can be a Christian or follow the Enlightenment. Thomas Jefferson held that there is a connection between the Enlightenment and belief in God. He said in the article in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are, listen to the word, created equal and endowed by their, listen to the word, creator with certain rights. Uh, so it's not like, oh, well, now I can be an atheist and that's when we get rights. These people, Enlightenment thinkers, believe in God. Mostly, not all of them, mostly did. And that is... Uh, noteworthy. Uh, we also see later at the end of this period women's suffrage. Remember, suffrage is not a bad thing, it affects the right to vote. We also see people saying, well, if we apply the principles of the Enlightenment, uh, we probably should get rid of slavery. And so, get rid of slavery is not just Enlightenment thinking, but we've mentioned before there was a role of British evangelical Christians who really say there is inconsistency holding that you're a Christian and trying to own slaves. We also see another big term, not just the Enlightenment, which lays the foundation for questioning and arguing for rights and social stuff. But also we see another word we should know that we've mentioned, nationalism. And you should all give two examples of how nationalism brought people together. Two European examples, two countries that never existed before. You should know about Europe, I'm sorry, about uh, Germany, and you should know about Italy. There had never been a Germany before. There never been an Italy before. Nationalism, you should know those two examples by name. Uh, that's an example of how nationalism brings unification. At the same time, there is discontent with imperialism. It often was inspired by liberal democratic ideas. So what is the result of the Enlightenment? We see the American Revolution as a result. And guess what? Non-white people have the same ideas of rights and you should know by name one revolution which was the successful non-white revolution in this time of revolutions that is the haitian revolution and guess what inspired the haitian revolution enlightenment thinking we also see the haitian uh the french revolution as well and after the haitian revolution we have latin american revolutions led by white creoles like Simon Bolivar. So a lot of revolutions. The Enlightenment is a revolution of thinking. It's starting to question traditional roles of religion. It's starting to question uh, divine right of kings, arguing for individual rights. We see that play on the American Revolution, which was uh, success, kind of. Uh, you know, if you don't count the fact that no women could vote and black people were owned as slaves. There's the French Revolution, which is very, you know, mixed, complicated record. Haitian Revolution is a success first successful black revolution, but then sadly, their government struggles, and then Latin American revolutions led by these white Creoles. A Creole is a white person in South in, in Latin America. Remember, in, in Latin America, there's a social pyramid, white people on the top, there's brown-skinned mestizos like myself, there are black people below them. So that's the Latin American. Another revolution, apart from political revolutions, we see the Industrial Revolution at this time. What are some things we see? We see urbanization. Urbanization is people moving from the country to the cities. That's a trend that we've seen. Uh, we see big invention, you should know by name, is the steam engine. The steam engine allows for factories to exist, allows travel to increase. Uh, so that's huge, huge, huge. Steam engine means I can have a factory anywhere. It doesn't have to be along the river necessarily. Uh, and we see coal and oil being huge, huge parts of that. Three pieces of technology that you might make reference to, we've talked about a lot, the railroad, which increases trade, steamships, it, it helps create a global economy because now I can like grow wheat in California and sell it to Great Britain. I can 
raise cattle in Argentina and sell it to Great Britain because I can be moving these things very quickly through steamships, the telegraph. It also creates instant communication, railroad, steamship, telegraph. These like the holy trinity of technology at this time. And it also helps empire because I can build railroads in India, railroads in Africa and get raw materials from the interior to market very quickly. I can use telegraph to communicate the locations of Native Americans who are fighting me and resisting me. I can conquer the West through these technologies. People you should know by name. There's a Scottish guy who wrote a book in 1776 called Wealth of Nations. You should know his name. He's one of the most famous men of all time. It's Adam Smith. And he wants to move away from mercantilism. Mercantilism, again, said that Spain should, should grow, should, Spanish colonies should only buy from Spain only sell to Spain. That's all, you know, you're, you're locked in. Rules and regulations. And Adam Smith argued in his book, Wealth of Nations for Capitalism, which says that there's something called laissez-faire. Laissez-faire means let it be, leave it alone. And it basically argues that government should get out of the way. He argued for capitalism and free markets. Trade became more intertwined across the globe. We see stock markets and businesses. As stock markets and corporations and factories increase, work con conditions aren't the greatest. Wages at first aren't the greatest. And so there's something workers decide to do. They decide to form labor unions where they can go on strike for better conditions. They wanted to reform. Some people said, you know what? Capitalism cannot be reformed. We don't need a reformation. We need a full revolution. And there's one guy you should know by name. If Adam Smith is the capitalist that says capitalism is the way, there's one guy who says capitalism is trash. It just leads to factories where rich, rich owners get all the money. Workers of the world need to unite. And this guy, you should know by name, is Karl Marx. And he said capitalism was no good. He encouraged socialist or even communist revolution. So societal changes we see. Uh, industrialization led to an increased standard of living for many. We actually just talked about this in lecture. We see a variety of consumer goods like shirts become cheaper, shoes become cheaper. It becomes possible for people to have multiple pairs of these things under capitalism. Wages eventually double. But also there's some bad things because if everyone's moving to the cities, guess what happens to the cities? They become overcrowded. Guess what the tenements are like? They're overpopulated. There's pollution, there's poor sanitation. So capitalism is not perfect. There are also consequences to industrialization. There was something called social Darwinism, where white people said, look, if we evolve from these ape-like creatures, I bet you can also see a pyramid of power among people. And who's the most dominant, who has factories, who has wealth, who has the best armies? White people do. So we must be on the very top, and brown and black-skinned people must be below us. This is called social Darwinism. This was something used to justify imperialism. Why is it okay for me to beat up and invade and conquer? Well, it's my white man's burden. It's my job. There's a word here to civilize the world, civilizing mission, that white people have the obligation to conquer Africa. I don't want to conquer Africa, but who's going to do it? You know, we have to do it. It's social Darwinism. Good examples of state expansion and indigenous responses. Indigenous responses are like how people respond. King Leopold II, you might remember in the Congo, he was like this famous Belgian leader who owned the Congo uh, and he abused people there in great ways. The British uh, the Belgians were in Indonesia. Uh, all these different things, we see that there was companies and corporations and it moved from companies and corporations like the Dutch East India Company to the Dutch. India was ruled by the British East India Company to full on being ruled by the British. The Belgian Congo was ruled by just King Leopold II as like his private property. And then it moved to like the Belgian government ruling it. So that's a general trend that we see. Uh, it says the United States, Russia, and Japan all conquered and settled both neighboring territories and faraway lands. You might remember we conquer Hawaii, we take over the Philippines. These native people in the Philippines try to resist and we kill thousands of them. I think a quarter million men, women, and children were killed by the United States Army as the Filipino people wanted their independence. The Japanese also remember like of all the people who like 
learn the lesson of modernization, it's the Japanese. And guess what they do? They beat up and conquer their neighbors. So we see that here. Uh, some Native Americans say, you know what, I bet there's a good example, specific example mentioned in our lecture called the ghost dance. And they said that if we dance, we'll bring back our ancestors and the white people will go away. And there was something called the Battle of Wounded Knee, where white uh, military from the U.S. actually slaughtered these peaceful protesters. There was a fancy word called millenarianism. Uh, where they bought, thought that these ghost dances would like bring the end of the world and white people go away. It didn't work out. Uh, Native Americans were slaughtered. You might remember there was something similar in South Africa, where South Africans, they started killing their own cattle. And they believed that if they killed their own cattle, they'd bring the ancestors back and white people go away. And that didn't work out either. Uh, we also see global economic developments from 17. So it, just in general, indigenous people try to resist. It typically doesn't really go well. Uh, the Sepoy Rebellion, they resisted, it didn't go well. Um, the Boxer Rebellion, they resisted, it didn't go well. Philippines, they resist, it doesn't go well. Hawaiians, they resist, it doesn't go well. That's sadly the theme of this time period. Global economic developments in the industrialized world, there's a demand for raw materials and food supplies. And we see that those dealing with natural resources, industrial crops, we see cotton as like the major export of Egypt. We see rubber as a big demand because factories need these sorts of things. And also large scale meat production, the handout says. And it mentions in South America, we've talked about in lecture how Argentina was growing ca cattle, uh, raising cattle and sending them to market. Also mentions palm oil in Africa. And we looked at how that is super destructive. We also see lasting migration in an interconnected world. New modes of transportation made it easier for population to shift and move. We see Japanese agricultural workers going to the Pacific Islands. Japanese went to Hawaii. Italians came to Argentina. I think we mentioned in the lecture this week, half of like 40% of Argentina's population is Italian. British engineers moved to South Asia and Africa. I think I also mentioned geologists did as well. Some migrants were well off, while others were forced to migrate due to extreme hardship. Uh, for example, the Irish potato famine, the Irish diaspora, we mentioned they didn't come here because they had skills. They came here out of desperate need. We also see the formation of ethnic enclaves. The examples we gave you were the Chinese who made enclaves in places like Chinatown and New York City and all around Southeast Asia. We saw Indians in particular in places like the Caribbean, where they brought Hinduism with them. We also saw Indians in South Africa, where places people like Gandhi would experience apartheid, and that would get his wheels thinking. Uh, they also face, there's a good word I didn't use in lecture, I wish I had, called xenophobia, or if you're xenophobic, you're afraid of outsiders, afraid of different things. We do see xenophobia in America. There's a law called the Chinese Exclusion Act, where we say no Chinese people can move to the U.S., and that doesn't end until like the 1940s. There was something called like the white Australia policy, where they tried to keep non-whites from moving there. These are examples of nativist approaches. A nativist is someone who says, hey, we just want our native people. And actually, it doesn't have to be like non-white people. It can also be white people. The number one group of people that were persecuted who were white were the Irish uh, by nativists. And because the Irish were a type of religion that most Americans were not, they were Catholic. Okay, so one hour, eight minutes. Uh, actually, it's probably just an hour. I think on the first five, six minutes, I was just kind of waiting for people. So we did about an hour review. Here's a review. There's great reviews online. I think there's a live one right now uh, that I'll send a link to. Uh, good luck. Uh, tomorrow's your day. I'm super proud of you. I'm excited for you guys. Uh, take advantage of those four choices. Follow the rubric. Keep in the time period. Answer the questions. Email me if you have questions. I'll do the best I can to get back to you. So uh, look forward to hearing good news about how the exam went. Talk to you guys later.